All right, this morning's sermon of titled The Era of Good Friday. Uh, the Era of Good Friday. I uh, thought, thought it'd be an interesting sermon for you guys. I go over the timeline of the, of the, um, the resurrection so you know uh, that Jesus didn't actually die on a Friday, even though that's when people think he died. And I'll show you from the Bible uh, why that's the case. But before we get into that, just a few comments about Easter. You know, I think it's, I always find it interesting. Um, I showed this a couple of years ago that, you know, people uh, will wear the cross and there's, there's nothing necessarily wrong with wearing a cross. You know, you know, what would be wrong is if you actually believe there's any sort of like power keeping, you know, sometimes people get a bit pagan with their crosses and they think, oh, if I wear this, you know, I'm being protected. And, you know, that's when it starts getting a bit idolatrous. But, you know, if you just wear it as a reminder of, you know, Jesus Christ and what he did for us, is not a problem. But what's interesting about this is that do you, do you realize that the cross we, we associate, obviously, with love and sacrifice and what Jesus did? Um, but the cross is a, is a torture device, right? I mean, that was, it's a device where, you know, somebody would be nailed to the cross and left to die and would die eventually of, a, uh, of asphyxiation, right? You can't breathe because you don't have the strength to, to pull yourself up to breathe. And it's just interesting that, you know, you don't see people like, you know, wearing a guillotine around their neck, you know, wearing a noose around their neck. But yet, yeah, because the, these symbols don't represent love like the cross does, because obviously... You know, the cross is worn as a symbol, but isn't it interesting that it's a, it's a method of torture? It's a, it's a method, method of capital punishment, and yet, uh, because of what Jesus did for us, it now uh, represents so much more. So, you know, why is the cross empty? You know, Christians, you know, Christians have a cross, it's empty. You'll find Catholics tend to use a cross with Jesus still on it. And uh, the significance there that I was always told is because Jesus is no longer on the cross. He, was, he died, he was taken off the cross, he's buried, and he's, he's alive now. So this is why uh, Bible-believing Christians tend to use a cross that is empty to represent the fact that he's risen again, as opposed to remembering a, a cross where he's still on the cross. Um, but, you know, that can be interpreted different ways. Now, the, the resurrection, obviously, is very important to the Christian faith. 1 Corinthians 15, 12, Now Christ be preached that he rose from the dead. How say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So what was happening in the Corinthian church is there were people uh, rejecting that, that we rise again from the dead, right? The resurrection. There was sex, sex S-E-C-T-S, of Christianity back then. Oh, not really. We wouldn't call it Christianity, but there were certain sects of people that did not believe in a resurrection, and he's addressing this false doctrine in the, in the Corinthian church. He's like saying, well, if there's, if there's no resurrection, if nobody rises from the dead, then that means Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And if there's no resurrection, then we don't have any hope. This is what he's talking about here. If there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. See, so you see how the resurrection is a critical part of the gospel. If people reject the resurrection, then they reject the gospel. They're not saved if they don't believe in the resurrection. Yea, and we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up, that he raised up Christ. I mean, he raised not up. So he's saying, hey, not only is our preaching vain if there's no resurrection, he's saying the, the apostles and the disciples are false witnesses because we're saying that God raised him up and he didn't raise him up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. So he's saying, you see, what you believe to be saved is the gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection. If there's no resurrection from the dead, then Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead. And then your faith is in nothing. Right? It's vain. It's not profitable. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So the resurrection is a critical part of the Christian faith. It's also one of the strongest arguments, I believe, for Christianity. And if you're arguing uh, with somebody who's not a Christian, if you understand the arguments for the resurrection and the facts and the evidence around the resurrection, it's, it's a very good thing to have in your back pocket because it's a very strong argument. And the argument, in a, in a nutshell, goes like this. You know, historically, we know that Jesus Christ existed, not just from the Gospels, but from other Jewish and, and, uh, uh, Jewish and Roman historians as well, that he existed, that he died on a cross, right? So we know that he died, definitely. We know that his body could not be found, 
because the enemies of Jesus Christ accused the Jews of stealing the body. So, right, so obviously that accusation would not have arisen if the body was there. So the body was missing. And then you have the early rise in Christianity of people that were not just believing that Jesus rose again, but were testifying that they had eaten with him and saw him. And not only that, it was people that were opposed to Christianity, right? You have Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, who was killing Christians, and he also claimed to have seen the Lord Jesus Christ. So these facts rule out a lot of theories, right? They rule out, you know, the, the swoon theory is that they believe Jesus didn't really die and that he was just sort of fainted on the cross. But then how, how did he resurrect in a different body? How did he convince his disciples that he rose again? People say, well, what about the hallucination theory? You know, that they all just saw a vision. But hallucinations are very individual. How do they all see the same thing? How do they all experience the same thing? Um, then you have, uh, you know, the is Islam has the replacement theory, right, which now has its problems. And David Wood did a recent video on that, that a lot of sheikhs and Islamic scholars are starting to say, don't, don't push the, you know, the, the replacement theory because that makes Allah a deceiver. That makes Allah the, the originator of Christianity, right? He was the one that deceived all the Christians into believing Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Um, and you have other theories, um, they're, they're, they're leaving my mind. You have the collusion theory, right? That all the disciples colluded together, but it doesn't make sense because why do you have people that did not believe? You know, what did they have to gain to do this? So a lot of the other theories come short, and the only really reasonable theory that is left is that he actually is who he says he is, that he was the Son of God that died and rose again. That is the best explanation of these historical facts. So if you understand these things, it's good to have it in your back pocket. Generally, when I'm out you know, preaching the gospel, if I get into a discussion with somebody that's not a believer, you know, my reasoning tends to follow that. It tends to be, look, you know, Jesus Christ... You know, well, first it would be creation and evolution. You know, usually you're addressing, is there a God, right? And then the question, well, who is this God? Well, Jesus Christ has this above every other religious leader, right? He's not just claiming to be a prophet. He's claiming to be God. He's claiming to rise from the dead. This is different to all these other religious leaders. And then, then you build your reasoning from that. If Jesus Christ is who he says he is, well, we better listen to what he says he believed that the Old Testament and, and his apostles was the word of God, and then that's how you reason everything else. So that that's, tends to be my, my reasoning when I discuss from scratch. It is, is there a God? Who is that God? And if Jesus says this is God's word, then we should follow God's word. Because sometimes you get caught up in just trying to re rationale the teachings of the Bible, but sometimes if I can come from that, then, then when I argue that, I can always say to the person, yeah, well, you believe that, that's reasonable, and I believe this, I'm reasoning it, but then what gives our beliefs credibility? It's going to go back to the founder, right? It's going to go back to where these texts come from, and we have Jesus Christ, which is basically the foundation of our faith. Who do they have, right? Whoever wrote their text, or whoever that, and then, then you can start having that discussion. So, very, very, very powerful way, I think, to, to discuss Christianity and convince others, persuade others. To, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is Jesus Christ's resurrection different to other resurrections in the Bible? Because you say, wait a second, because in the Bible, people have died and they've been raised again. So what's so special about Jesus dying and rising again? Well, his, his resurrection is slightly different. Uh, I'll give you a few things. But in Acts 2, it says here in verse 31, he's seeing this before, this is uh, Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost, he's seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Right. So one thing that makes his resurrection different is that nobody has been resurrected from act actual death. Right. Like as we say, physical death is death, but that's just your soul separating from your body. But the real death is the death of the soul. Right. When the soul descends into hell. See, those of us who are saved, or you know, very young children. When we die, physically, right, we go on to live in heaven. We don't actually experience death in the real sense. But Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ, when he died for our sins, his soul didn't just separate from his body. His soul actually descended into hell to pay for our sins. And that's what makes his resurrection even more significant, right? Because he actually rose out of hell. He overcame death and, and rose again. So his soul was not left in hell. 
So when he says here in Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead. This is true. He was truly, his soul was dead in hell for us, rose again. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Not only that, see, in Jesus' resurrection, he raised himself. See, in other resurrection, like Lazarus, Lazarus, who raised Lazarus out of the grave? It was Jesus, right? Lazarus, come forth. Whereas with Jesus' resurrection, he raised himself up, right? Being God. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and will thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. So a couple of comments there about Easter, uh, about uh, Easter itself. Now, what about the, the holiday itself? So getting into, I've got three sections in this sermon, and we're talking about the era of Good Friday. But just on the holiday itself, Easter, Easter is not a pagan holiday. See, a lot of people think you know, Easter is this pagan holiday, and they think, uh, you know, there's this goddess of fertility, I think it's Ex Esther or Exter, and they think the word comes from that, right? And they think this is what Easter is about, but it, it's not. Easter is just a different word for Passover, and I'll, and I'll show you this in the Bible. But, but in saying that, you know, we should not celebrate Easter with pagan practices. You know, it's like my, my, I have the same view on Christmas, where, you know, if you're going to celebrate Christmas, ditch the Santa Claus outfits, ditch the elves, ditch all that rubbish. Don't be guilty as a Christian of perpetuating these false practices, right? It's like if you're going to celebrate Christmas, then make it about Jesus' birth, you know, and make it about what it should be about. You know, I'm not saying that Jesus was born on December 25th, but if you're going to choose a day to remember Jesus' birth, then make it about that. Don't say, I'm a Christian, I'm going to remember Jesus' birth, and then make it about Santa Claus, celebrate with Santa Claus, you know, buy your kids Santa outfits and elf outfits. Why do that? So it's the same with Easter. You know, if you're going to celebrate Easter and you're going to make it about the death, burial, and resurrection, then make it about the death, burial, and resurrection. Don't go out and spend your money on chocolate bunnies and chocolate eggs, have Easter egg hunts, and just, what has that got to do with Jesus? You know, but Christians keep perpetuating these things. Let's stop. Gosh, if it's not going to stop with us, guys, who's it going to stop with? You think the world's going to stop doing that? They're trying to change it into whatever they want to, you know, they want to make it into. And then, God forbid that God's people would perpetuate it. But this is what happens. Let's not do that. Don't perpetuate these things. We're going to celebrate these days, these special Christian days. Let's make it about Jesus as opposed to about all these other pagan practices because that's where the bunnies and the Easter eggs come from. You know, because people think, you know, this goddess of fertility and all that, that's where that comes from. And they're trying to tie it in with the Passover, which is what the, the word Easter, where the word Easter comes from, right? Now, in Acts 12, we see here that this is the one place where the word Easter is used in the Bible, right? Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So this is in the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So this is when Peter is in prison and they're praying for him and that whole story about how he comes out. They don't believe he gets out of prison. So we see here, now, some people make the argument here. Well, let me first say this. Just, just some history behind this English translation of the word. If, you, if you're not sure how Easter got into the English Bible, because prior to that, you know, the, the word was, uh, what, what, Pasha or something like that, whatever the word in Hebrew and Greek was for the Passover, right? And then when they trans were translating the Bible, they never translated that word. So it always stayed that word in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then what happened is when Tyndale came along, like Tyndale was in the English translator, the first English translation of the Bible. So at the time in, 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 in English-speaking countries, that, that, that festival was known as Easter. So he translated it as Easter instead of just using you know, the, the Greek or the Hebrew word because it wasn't actually translated, right? It was just transliterated. And then he actually came up. See, we now know that word as the word Passover, 
right, which is that celebration that, that the Jews had. But that was a word that was made up by Tyndale, like as a translator, he actually created the word Passover. That word comes from, you know, when God passed over them in Israel with the Passover lamb. So we call it Passover now because as Tyndale, as an English translator, created that word. So he, in the New Testament, right, used the word Easter. That's why in Tyndale's Bible, the word Easter appears like 14 times. Now, as the English Bibles were getting reviewed and reviewed, then it started being changed over to Passover. Some people think that this might have been an oversight where they left this one in, right? But, you know, now we, we have this one occurrence of this word, so we know that Easter is the days of unleavened bread. Now, some people argue that, no, this can't be the days of unleavened bread because they think Easter or Passover refers to the first day of that feast, which is what we let, read in Leviticus 23. So they say the Passover is the 14th, and then you have 15th to the next seven days, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the argument for people saying Easter isn't the Days of Unleavened Bread is they'll say, well, Easter refers to the first day, not to the whole period of time. But when they were in prison, the, it was already the Days of Unleavened Bread, so it wouldn't make sense to say he's intending after Easter to let them out because Easter's already happened. Do you get that argument? I know it's a, a, they might have just flew and hit the, hit, the, hit the wall at the back there. But... Do you get what I'm saying? If the Easter is the first day and they're saying we're going to let them out after Easter but the days of unleavened bread are already happening, then obviously it doesn't make sense to say let them out after Easter because you're already after Easter if it's already the first day. So the argument is that's not the Passover, it's some other festival, right? But what I want to show you in the Bible is the, is the word Passover, which is what Easter is, it's just a synonymous word in the English translation, right? Is that word Passover refers to that first day, which have the day of Passover, but it also refers to that period of time, the days of unleavened bread. Right? Look at this in Luke 22.1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. Right? So you see that that word is not only used for that first day when they killed the lamb, but also that whole period. So, you know, don't get caught. I'm not saying that it's not pagan things out there, but don't get too caught up in thinking, oh, Easter's paying all that, because that whole thinking is when people start believing Christians shouldn't celebrate Easter, Christians shouldn't celebrate Christmas. And then what's next? Christians shouldn't celebrate birthdays. I've heard this argument. Christians shouldn't celebrate birthdays, because who celebrated a birthday in the Bible? King Herod. <laughs> ah, you pagan. Like, you know, but, you know, people make these arguments. But, you know, we have to just give people liberty. There's, there's liberty in Christianity for you to practice certain things how you like, right? As long as it doesn't conflict with God's word. Okay? So that's where Easter comes from. Now let's talk about Good Friday. We spent a bit of time here. Good Friday, the error of Good Friday. Right? Now currently the popularly held belief is that Jesus died on a Friday. Now that may make it convenient for like the long weekend, you know, because then you've got, you know, Jesus... Friday, I get Friday off because it's like, because then otherwise we'd have to have the, the Wednesday off and two days back to work and then you got, and then the Sunday you recognize on Monday. But that's, that's not why it's, it's held, but that's, this is why on Friday you see everyone tweeting about Jesus' death, right? Because everyone believes that he died on a Friday. Now, why do they believe he died on a Friday? It's not completely irrational, it's just not biblical. Right? Now, Mark 15, verse 42, it says here, Now, when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath. Joseph of Arimathea, an honourable counsellor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. So, you know, if you read through the Bible and you don't really understand different Sabbaths and how these things work, you would think, well, obviously Jesus died before the Sabbath. Right? So you say, well, the day before the Sabbath is a Friday, right? Because Sabbath is Saturday. So the Sabbath is Saturday, you know, Sunday we think of the last day of the week, but it's actually the first day of the week. And that's, this is the reason why we, we meet for church. Right? So we don't, we don't meet for church, just so you guys know, we don't meet for church on Sunday because it's the new Sabbath. You know, right? this is, that's Catholic doctrine. Right? Catholic doctrine is, you know, they, they changed Saturday, Saturday, the Sabbath. Sunday's the new Sabbath, and we're keeping the Sabbath on Sundays. That's why we go to church on Sundays. That's not, that's not why we meet on Sundays. We meet on Sundays because Jesus rose again on the first day of the week. 
And we see in the New Testament that the disciples met on the first day of the week to break bread. They met on the first day of the week when they gathered up. So we see that pattern. So it's from that 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 tradition comes, right? That we meet on the first day of the week in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, that's the reason why we meet on Sundays. It's not because it's the Sabbath. But this is why people believe that Jesus died on Friday because they think we know that he died the, on the preparation day, which was the day before the Sabbath, and then most people assume that that's Friday. But so this is their, their sort of timeline, right? Their timeline is like this. So you, you'd say, well, they probably were having the Last Supper on the Thursday night, and then day one is the preparation, which is the day before the Sabbath, right? And then Christ dies at the ninth hour of the day. So the day starts at 6 a.m., so nine hours later would be 3 p.m. So Jesus died at 3 p.m. on whatever the day he died, or they'd say, say Friday. And then that night he was buried, right? So this is the seventh day Sabbath. And I suppose they would have to believe as well that that Saturday was also the Passover, right? So th those happen to coincide on the same day. And then he's in there in the morning as well, so the evening and the morning. And then night three is when he resurrected, right? Because on Sunday morning, he's, he's found uh, <clears throat> the tomb is empty, right? When, when uh, you know, the ladies come, you know, early the first day of the week, his tomb is empty. So he must have resurrected like somewhere here, you know, somewhere between this, this joint, right? So now if we were to see it, one thing in the, in the Bible is, see, we think in, in our calendar and the way we think of things, we think the day starts first. So we think the day starts with the morning and then the evening. In the Bible, it's the opposite way around. Right? So the day starts, the, so the Wednesday would start in the evening at 6 p.m. and then it would go until the next evening. Right? So in Genesis 1.5, it says here, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. So you're saying, why, does it, why is it worded that way? Because their day starts in the evening and then the day is the second half of the day and then it goes over to the next day. So if you were to shift this where you put the evening and the morning the opposite way around, now you'd have it in the days. So Friday evening, they're having that last supper, right? And then they go out to the Garden of Gethsemane and all that stuff happens. He gets beaten and everything and then that's, that's like overnight and then he dies at the ninth hour when he finally dies there. And then... Saturday, night two, day two, Sunday. And the tomb's found empty. So that's how traditionally people see it. Now the problem with this timeline is this verse. Matthew 12, 40. Because Jesus says here, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So the way they generally reason it is they'll say, well, because remember, he's not spending this time dead. Right? He's having the last supper. He dies here at the ninth hour. But they'll say, well, because he dies at the ninth hour, they technically he's in there one day. He's in there part of a day. Then he's in there for the whole Saturday. And then he's probably rose on Sunday. So maybe he spent part of the day dead on Sunday. And then when he rose, so then that's three days. Right? So they say Friday, Saturday, and a bit of Sunday. So three days later. That's, that's how they reason. But that's not what the Bible says, right? The Bible doesn't say just three days. Right? The Bible says three days and three nights. So where do you get three days and three nights from? Because you've got day one, day two, and then night two and night three. So where's night one and day three? Right? So you're, you're missing parts of the timeline, right? when you believe Jesus died on a Friday, and that's not the case. But this is the problem with this view. Right? The problem with this view is it's not just three partial days. Right? He says he's in the heart of the earth, like Jonah, three days and three nights. Right? So what is the real timeline? Let's look at some verses first, and then I'll give you a visual. Okay? The real timeline. First of all, we're going to go to Exodus 12, so we can see the instruction given to the nation of Israel on the Passover lamb, right? And this is what's amazing about Jesus' death. Like, you know, I don't know if you realize this, that he is, 
he remember he's he's dying according to the scriptures right he was buried he rose again the third day according to the scriptures so the timing of his death and burial and resurrection and all these things line up with these these feasts right these feasts that were given this this feast that was given to the nation of israel the lord spake unto moses and aaron in the land of egypt saying this month shall be unto you the beginning of months it shall be the first month of the year to you speak ye unto all the congregation of israel saying in the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers a lamb for an house and if the household be too little for the lamb let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month so notice you know you don't have to be too smart to figure out why it has to be without blemish because what is that representing right that's representing the spotless lamb of god right the lamb of god that takes away the sin of the world so you can see here 10 days prior they choose the lamb based on the size of their household it says if your household's too small then do it with the household next to you and you have this meal together but the lamb has to be without blemish Right? So you can't like say, oh, you know, that one's missing a leg, so let's take that one to pass over. You've got to have a, your best, be the best lamb, you know, a lamb without blemish. Right? So this is representing Jesus Christ. You shall keep it up until the 14th day. So on the 10th day, they present this lamb. Right? This is the lamb they're going to kill. The 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses, wherein they shall eat it and they shall eat it the flesh in that night roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it eat not of it raw nor sodden so not boiled at all with water but roast with fire so this is this is prophetical about jesus dying for our sins and paying for them in hell because you know this is why they say you know, it must be roasted with fire why because it represented him dying and going to hell for us his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof and you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning and that which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire so this is when the lambs presented the 10th day 14th day it is killed now let's look at leviticus 23 where we started where we read through this morning i want to show you that these days this passover day and this first day of the feast of unleavened bread are actually sabbaths as well right so remember there is not just the saturday sabbath which is the weekly rest sabbath day right that's every it was every saturday but there are also these other sabbaths right that occur and these were days they called holy convocations and they were also days where people did no work the lord spake unto moses saying speak unto the children of israel saying to them concerning the feasts of the lord which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. And holy convocations. You see the link there that holy convocation is what a Sabbath is. Right? He's saying, hey, the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings now he's going to mention other sabbaths or holy convocations where no work should be done these are the feasts of the lord even holy convocations which he shall proclaim in their seasons in the 14th day of the first month at even is the lord's passover so that's what we learned just then in exodus 12 was implemented the 10th day is when they presented the lamb the 14th day is when they killed it that was a sabbath day that was a holy convocation and on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the lord seven days you must eat unleavened bread in the first day you shall have an holy convocation you shall do no servile work therein but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the lord seven days in the seventh day is a holy convocation you shall do no work therein so you can see there that the passover the 14th day is a holy convocation the first day of the feast of unleavened bread so the first day after the passover was another sabbath you don't do any work and then at the end of the seven days of unleavened bread there's another sabbath holy convocation you don't do any work in them 
right? And this is key to understanding why Jesus can die before a Sabbath, but it's not the seventh day Sabbath, right? So let's look here in, in John uh, 19, right? John 19, verse 31, we see here that this Sabbath that Jesus died on was a different Sabbath, right? The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, so remember before we read in Matthew, in, uh, Matthew that the preparation was the day before the Sabbath, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. Look at this. For that Sabbath day was a high day. What does that mean? What's a high day? A high day is like it's, it's a more of an exalted holiday, right? So, this, so it's what it's saying here is this Sabbath day, it was a special Sabbath day. Right? Because what was it? This Sabbath day was going to be a Passover. It wasn't just going to be the regular seventh-day Sabbath. Besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first and the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Right? So this Sabbath day was something important. Now, we want to see when Jesus died. I just want to show you this verse. Right, Mark 15, 34, and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, what, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, and saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come down to take him down, will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. So, you see that at an even on the 14th, so in reality they did it just slightly before the 14th, right? Because at even it would be at 3 o'clock, they're killing the lamb. Jesus died at even on the ninth hour on the day of the preparation. Why is it called the preparation? Because they're preparing for Passover. Because why? Because Passover, first day, they're not meant to be doing any work. So they're doing all this work prior. So what is really, what's crazy about Jesus dying at this time. Can you imagine in Israel, everyone's getting their Passover lamb together. To, you know, four days ago, this lamb without blemish, they're getting ready to kill this Passover lamb, and at the same time, they're all slaughtering their lamb. Jesus dies on the cross. I mean, like, it's, that's just amazing, the timing of all this. Um, why? Because Jesus is fulfilling this feast this Passover feast, right? And he even feel, fulfills the, the presentation. Remember the presentation was on the 10th day? This is why we get Palm Sunday. So Palm Sunday was the Sunday prior to his resurrection. That's when he's presented to Israel. You know, they lay down the palm trees. They say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. This is the lamb being presented to the household, right? That this is the lamb without spot. So then Jesus, six days before the Passover, so this is what I figured out. When they say six days before something, it includes that day as well. Because you have the Saturday, which is the, uh, sorry, you have the Passover coming, which was the Thursday in this timeline, right? So you have Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, Sunday, Saturday, right? So Saturday is when he's, is this day right now. Where he's eating with Lazarus. Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from death. So he's eating with Lazarus on a Sabbath, right, the Saturday. There they made him a supper. Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. On the next day, so what's this day? Sunday. Much people that would come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. So you can see that the 10th day is that Sunday, and then you have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is the Passover. See that four-day period? The 10th day and the 14th day. So isn't that cool that, like, you know, you have the Passover presenting the Lamb without blemish, Jesus being presented on the 10th day and then being killed on the Passover. Right, so what is, how does the timeline actually look? Right, so the timeline actually looks like this. So we did it morning and evening in our calendar. Right? Morning a.m., you have the preparation day. 
Jesus Christ dies at the ninth hour, right? The ninth hour, he cried with a loud voice. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, right? He gave up the ghost. So really what's happening on the day before the Passover, when, when we say they kill the lamb at even, it's kind of like this period just before they go into the Passover, right? So they're going to kill and prepare it here, the preparation, and then they're eating and celebrating on the Passover with the unleavened bread and all that. So you have the preparation. Christ dies at 3, three o'clock, right? Then even starts. You have night one, which is the Passover. Goes over to day one, which is the day of the Passover. Then night two, you have the first day of unleavened bread, right? And then, uh, this is night two, sorry. And then that goes to day two, first day of unleavened bread. Then night three, you now have the Saturday, which is the seventh day Sabbath. Night three, and then day three is the seventh day Sabbath. And he probably resurrected somewhere in this period, right? So it could have been anywhere in this period here. So he's resurrected. And then early on in the first day of the week, so the ladies are coming around here to anoint his body with spices, and then they find the tomb empty, right? So that's why we celebrate on the Sunday, because that's when he resurrected, right here. So if we put that, if I put that like the Bible has evening and morning, it's a bit easier for you. So we have evening and the morning were the first day. So we have Last Supper, they're eating, preparation. Remember Jonas, three days and three nights, night one, day one, night two, day two, night three, day three, and then he resurrects on the first day of the week. Right? So if, you know, so is it, should it be Good Friday? No, Good Friday would not line up with the Bible. It should actually be Good Wednesday. Right? Good Wednesday. Wednesday night is when people should be celebrating Jesus' de death, if they want to celebrate Jesus' death. But, you know, I think having the celebration on Sunday is, is fine. Now, what's interesting about this timeline, and I don't know if you realize this, is, this, remember the Sabbath. The Sabbath represented a day of rest a holy convocation where you did no work, right? Now notice, when Jesus dies, you know, the three days he's dead, what do you have? Passover, Sabbath, first day of unleavened bread, a Sabbath, and then the Saturday of rest, Sabbath. Isn't that an amazing thing? And when Jesus Christ died and he went to hell to suffer for your sins, no man did any work. That's a picture of the gospel. Right? The gospel is you're saved by the grace of God. You do no work. And I just find it amazing that the timing of Jesus' death puts three Sabbaths in a row, showing that while Jesus is paying for our sins, nobody's doing any work. Right? Because salvation is by grace. So like I said, Good Friday works well maybe to create a long weekend, but it's not the biblical day that Jesus died. So it'd be a Wednesday. But as Christians, you know, the resurrection is on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. That's what's celebrated. It's the reason why we meet for church. So let's, let's make Easter about Jesus. Let's not make it about, you know, the goddess of fertility with the Easter bunnies and the eggs. If we're going to celebrate Easter, let's make it about Jesus. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that while you were suffering in hell for our sins, Lord, man was resting from his own works. So we thank you, Lord, that salvation is by grace. We don't earn salvation. You did all the hard work to make it easy for us. We thank you that we can remember that this morning. And we pray these things in your precious name. Amen.